Welcome, I'm Katherine Martinez. Thanks for joining me for part two of the Quick Start to Designs and Machine Embroidery's newest inspiration software, Dime Vintage Embroidery. As you saw in the part one video, it's so easy to get a textured look to clothing, home deck, or whatever may be your passion. Dime Vintage brings the nostalgic look of hand embroidery to meet up with today's technology to make it easy and fast to get looks like these. In Vintage Quick Start Part 1, we saw how to work with the built-in designs, the cutter, and the outline tool. Part 2 will cover the text, the repair tool, and we will revisit the cutter. As we saw in Part 1, the opening screen is very similar to all of Dime's inspiration software. Of course, the tools that are specific to Dime Vintage are the ones that are on the screen. Remember, too, at your fingertips is the Dime Vintage Manual to be found under Help. All right, let's get started with this one-of-a-kind software. We begin with the text tool, the large F on our digitizing toolbar. I'll select it, bring my mouse to screen, and when I click on the screen, I see the capital letter A in the last font that I've played with. Coming over here to the text box, I'll go ahead and type in the word Vintage and apply and we see it shown on screen. If I bring my mouse over to the font window I can click on that and we're brought into the catalog that shows us all 18 fonts that are available to us in Dime Vintage. I'll begin with the Arial Vintage font and OK that and we see the look on screen. If we come back over here to the drop down arrow I could click on my drop down arrow and select the next one in line, Bajas Vintage, and simply now I'm going to use my down arrow on my keyboard and run through all 18 of those fun fonts just to get a feel of what each and every one looks like. They're all slightly different, which is fun, and we'll end with our stressed vintage. As we ran through those, what did we notice? First of all, the density is very different than what we're used to seeing in other software with text capabilities, say Perfect Embroidery Pro and Word Art and Stitches. As we look at this stressed vintage, let's come over to our properties text, choose our second icon, the fill, and we notice that the fill type is standard, satin, which we are comfortable with, but we notice that the density is 1.8 millimeter. Going back to our first text properties, we'll go into our catalog, and this time let's go back to that Bajas Vintage and take a look. If we come to our fill here, we see that by default the density for that particular font is 3.7. If we were to compare that look to Perfect Embroidery Pro, the same font, we see here the Bajas font in the Dime Vintage. Again, the default is 3.7, and if we compare it to on the right-hand side, the Vintage Bajas font in Perfect Embroidery Pro, we see that the default equals 0.5 millimeter. We see that this uncompacted, more sparse, loose density gives us the look of vintage or well-worn, well-loved. Yes, we can change the density level of any text. We could come into Fill Property, take a look at that density, I could put that back to a one millimeter and apply, but it's very filled in, and I'm not sure I would want to do that. If I'm in Vintage, I'm after that special look. You can increase the number for the density, making it more sparse. I could put that to four and apply, and it has even less threads than the default of the 3.5. As you see in this slide, I've done that with this letter E. I wanted a light look of thread over the map fabric. If you watched part one, you know that this was the first project I completed for my vintage samples, and once I saw the look of the flowers in the heavier 15-weight rope thread, I was captivated. Looking at the next of my samples, here I've used one of the applique fonts on this denim vest for the word vintage, and then the word style is done in damaged vintage, and I've adjusted some of the defaults to get this different look around the word. Let's take a look back in the software and open a file that I have compared those two words here in the blue, back up just a little bit so it's not so in your face, here in the blue this is the default damage vintage and if we take a look we see that the density is 1.8 millimeter. If we take a look at the jagged edge we see that it's set for both and the jagged value is 1. 
If I select my version of the word and we go back into the fill, the density I've bumped up to a 4. If we look at jagged edge, you can see that I've also changed the jagged value to 4. Take a look at the differences between the two. They're both very fun. It's just that I have exaggerated that outside frayed edge. We'll go back to our first vintage word and go into our font choices. I'm going to make this one Frank's Vintage. Bring this up just a little bit here and come over so we're centered a bit. Just like in the other inspirational software from Dime, we have all of the editing capabilities for the word and the individual letters here. The blue horizontal triangles, when we rest on them, we get a crosshairs, allow left right movement of the letters following that triangle. I could move those letters to the left or to the right. I'll go ahead and do an undo, put that back. The black diamond allows us to play with an individual character. I could size that character, come up here to the pink rotate, move it, whatever I wanted to do to an individual character. Again, we'll undo and put that back where it belongs. The corner symbols add additional editing capabilities. If you need help with these editing options, don't forget that your manual is built right into the software and you can access it under Help, Manual. We're brought directly to that manual. I have Windows 10 on my computer. I'll go ahead and click on the page. It will bring up the go to for my page number. I happen to know that the text starts on page 31 and all I would need to do then is to scroll down and find the information necessary for those additional editing capabilities in my text. It's always helpful to have a refresher at our fingertips. If we take a look under properties underlay, we see that by default we have contour and perpendicular. This makes sense to keep the integrity of the vintage look. The less dense, more see-through. The contour underlay has the stitches running around the shape of the letter. For perpendicular, those stitches are straight up and down. With the realistic view off, we can see that perpendicular stitch more easily and it looks as if it would be noticeable. But once again, when we turn on the realistic view, we can't really see that underlay. Other property defaults that may be different depending on the font choice are pull push. The default is set to absolute in Perfect Embroidery Pro. That default for a fill stitch is set to none. Also, we have the column jagged type set to both. In PEP, it is none. And we also have for this particular font a jagged value of 1. If I were to change that, and you know that you can, you see that I really have exaggerated that jagged edge. Do be careful though, take a look at the letter A. It's filled in our inner hole and those areas for the letter E and G are somewhat filled up as well. We'll do an undo, put that word back to the way that it was. Let's go back into our text properties and add a second line. I'll hit my enter. This time I'll type in both upper lowercase and apply. And what we see here is only the letter S. The reason for that, if we come over here and rest on our window for the font chosen, we see that the available characters are only capital letters. Going back into the catalog, we see eight fonts with lowercase and eight without, not counting these two applique fonts. Once again, let's choose Arial Vintage. In. And we see both the word vintage and style because Arial Vintage, once again we come up here to check, we can see it has both uppercase and lowercase. Let's play with some of the other properties that we're comfortable with with text. First of all, I'll just go ahead and change that height to a 2 and apply it. A little difference in size. Once again, a little big for us to play with here, so I'll back it out just a little bit. Let's do our space. By default, it's set to 0. I'm going to put in a negative 10 and apply, and that negative number will bring the letters closer to each other. If I come back and put a positive 10 and apply, you can see that that spreads out the characters. With our line spacing, because we have two lines of text, the default is set to a 25%. 
I'm going to change that to a 50% and apply. And notice that the spacing between the rows of text or the lines of text, which is called letting, has increased. We can play with italic. A check mark will give a slight slant to our letters. We'll take that off. If we play with stairs and apply, with stairs, once again, we do not see our word style, but the reason for that is when you use stairs, you can only apply that to one line of text. If I come back up into my text box and put a space and bring that back to have this be one line of text and apply, here I see both words showing in my stairs. I'll take that stairs off and apply. Once again, we'll put this back to two lines of text so that we can play with our alignment. By default, it is set to center. If I apply, we see the word style centered under vintage. Of course, with the line, we can do either a left align, depending on the project that we're doing, or a right align, and it gives us that alignment. With our right align, we see that the last letter in the word style is not aligned under the letter E. So I look back into my text box and I see that I have an extra space at the end when I made that a one line phrase. So I'll go ahead and backspace that out, now apply, and you'll see those two letters become right aligned. We also have some fun types that are built in. If we choose circle and apply, because we have two lines of type, the word vintage is at the top of the circle and the word style is at the bottom. We have editing symbols here as well that you can play with. If I rest on that gold dot and drag in, you can see that I'm making the letters, the characters themselves smaller, but the circle is the same size. Go ahead and undo that. I can take my pink symbol and if I drag that down to the center, what I'm doing is keeping the letters at the same size, but I'm changing the size of the circle. Again, we'll put that back. We also have a green dot to the side. Click and drag. I am changing the circle to be more of an ellipse. And here we put that back. If I come back to my vintage style text box, once again, I'm going to click after the word vintage and use a delete so that I now have vintage style is all one and apply and we see that that whole phrase is at the top of our circle. So you have lots of options when you're playing with this particular circle type. I will go ahead and use my drop down, come down to vertical. With my vertical applied, I get just that. My vintage is all in one line. If I were to come up here and again put that to two lines and apply, you will notice that I only see the vintage. When you work with vertical, it too must be one single line. I'll go ahead and undo that so I have the one line of text. We need that one line of text also to use our path. The text on path will not work if we have multiple lines of type. Here we have our vintage style, a little bit different look to this particular type. If I right click and come down to edit baseline, here I see one point in the center. I'll go ahead and drag that up. To get the words to follow your path, we are not going to come over here to apply, but rather we're simply going to click on one of the letters themselves. And you can see now that my vintage style has followed that arc. We can also do a right click, edit that baseline. I can come in here and do a right click and choose to add a point, drag that shape down a bit. Again, I would not use my apply key and I will simply click on one of the characters and it will follow that style for me. Lots of fun things you can do with our vintage text. We'll go ahead and put this back to normal and apply. As always, we also have the ability to do an envelope or shape the text. We'll take a look at this slide where you see my baseball hat. You see the word vintage slightly curved to fit within this pretty border. We'll come back into the software. The first thing I want to do is to remove the word style, have only the word vintage. Notice too that it is selected. 
To bring back the editing capabilities of the text, we simply come back up here to the text tool and click on that. Now I'm able to do a right click, come down to envelope, and here with all of these shapes, I chose curved up. Let's curve just a little bit. I'm going to exaggerate just a hair and come over to our properties and do a few things to the word. The first thing I want to do is to space out the text just a bit. I'm going to come into the fill and make that irregular edges and apply. All right, with those few changes to the word vintage, I'm going to come back to the text and change the height to a one so that it'll fit nicer within the border. Let's come up to our designs tool, come into border decorations. The one I want is 0005D without the applique. I'll bring that to screen so that we can differentiate between the border and the letters themselves. I'll go ahead and make the border pink. At this point, I'm going to select my word vintage and drag it up to be in the space within that area. It's a little wide, so I'm going to drag those side handles just a bit and maybe make it a little taller so that it fits within that space nicely. I like the look of that. There is one other thing I prefer to do, and that is to have my words stitched last. Do you notice that portions of the decoration itself are going to stitch on top of my characters, and I would rather have the characters on top? All I need to do is come up here and ask it to move front. We take a look in sequence view, and I see that my border will stitch first, and then my text will stitch. So this is what I did to get the look of our hat. I stitched this design on hooped tearaway stabilizer and a cotton that would fray. If you have a free arm machine with a hat jig or you have the magnetic hoop clip from Dime, you could treat this design as an applique and use the border design without the D to give you the placement and tack down stitches for the applique, similar to what you see here on the gray hat with the New York applique. Speaking of appliques, in this new screen, we'll click on our tool for text, click on the design screen. I'll come back up here and type in vintage style once again. And I'll go ahead and make those two lines. I'll apply. We'll come into our window to get to our catalog. Here we see the two fonts that are indicated in green. These are the two applique fonts that we're given. We'll go ahead and play with hand vintage. Back this out just a little bit so you can see what we're working with. As we come into slow redraw, notice that we have two different colors. The blue is going to give us the placement of all of those characters and the red is giving us the tack down. And then we have another color, green, which I'll talk about in just a moment. With that slow redraw, we noticed that these designs are done in a run bean stitch. To verify that, if I select our text and come over here to Properties Run, you can see that indeed the type is set to bean. What's nice is that by default, we do have those two colors for those stitches, so we would have a stop on the machine to insert the fabric. You could also trim the letters after the run was completed. Here we see in Eileen's t-shirt that she's trimmed around each of those characters. Now, what about those long green stitches that we see in the word style? First, they are called repair stitches, as if we have done hand darning over a rip or a worn area. In this slide, they're represented by the dark gold thread. Secondly, you will only see them on letters typed as lowercase, even though the actual letter shows as uppercase. Okay, that's a little different. Let's take a look here and see if this helps to explain it for you. For these two applique fonts, we see that typing in uppercase gives no repair stitches. Typing in lowercase gives the repair stitches to those uppercase letters. A little different, but not difficult. Just something to remember. Let's take a closer look to what I did on this vest. Now I will admit here I am raising the challenge factor for those of you who are comfortable to do this. We'll choose a new screen, 
Knowing now that we get the repair stitches when we type with lowercase letters, I'm going to use my text tool and type in lowercase letters. Once again, using my word vintage. Here, we see repair stitches on each and every character. Why? Once again, because we've typed in lowercase letters. With the word selected, let's come up here to our outline tool. Do you remember this from part one, Vintage Quick Start? We'll click on that. The default comes in as a point 16. We'll go ahead and OK that. And you see that it brings the outline only around each repair stitch. It is also called a cut line. We talked about this in our part one. If I were to select all and come back into my cutter, we can see that the individual letters are listed. I'm going to come down and remove that check mark from optimize orientation. Here's our letters in the appropriate orientation. Notice too that we have another frame. If I click on that, here are all of the repair holes for this particular word. Now, this isn't exactly what I wanted. I'll close here because really what I wanted was the look of a rip or a small hole under my repair stitches. That's going to require both the word and the repairs to have a cut line. Back into the software, into our word vintage, I'm going to back out a bit here so we can have two things on the screen. To get an outline around the entire word, it can't contain any repairs within, which means I have to type it in uppercase letters. Once again, my text tool, I'll click, come in here, all caps, type my word, and go ahead and apply. Now with that word chosen, I can come up and do an outline. I'm going to bump this up just a bit here. We'll do an OK, and I have that outline surrounding my entire letter. Because it is all caps, I have no automatic repair stitches, as in the lower one. But wait, the designers of this so very fun software have given us the ability to place repair stitches wherever we want them. I'm going to go ahead and select that bottom word and delete it. Come in closer to our word vintage. I love the icon for repairs. We come up here and it is represented by a band-aid or in generic, no plug for a product terms, an adhesive bandage. Clicking on that brings me into the catalog of repair stitches of which there are 50. I simply click on the desired repair and OK it. It comes into the screen. I'm going to group that so that I can click and drag that into position on my Word. Once again, I go into my repair. We'll choose something else fun here, a double click. I want to group it and drag it and drop it onto the desired character. And I'm just going to add a couple more here to our characters come down and group that and if I take a look that might be fun right in the middle of the A. I might not always place my repairs in the proper order going across my characters because once I bring the repair to screen the shape of it might dictate its placement but I do try to remember to do a group and we can play wherever we think that those particular shapes will be. I could continue to add as I'd like certainly can scroll down to see what other options I have. I'll group that one, maybe bring that over to the end, and you can see really how much fun this becomes in adding your own repairs. We also have the ability to rotate those repairs. I could come up here and do a horizontal flip. I also can copy paste, certainly do a mirror image. Any of the normal capabilities you have for editing are available to us within our repairs. If you were to stitch the design as shown on screen, you would have a look similar to this, where the repair stitches are stitched directly on the applique fabric. In the close-up, you can see that I have a small piece of denim placed behind that particular repair stitch. 
If you like that look, you could add a few pieces of small fabric behind the repair stitches. Once my design is as I'd like it to be with all of the repairs in it, I would want to cut the entire word shape with the holes on my Silhouette Cameo. What I mean by that is to get this look right here. You see that the fabric itself is one piece, both the outline of the word vintage as well as the repair holes have been cut on the Cameo. To do so, the outline of the word must be before the repairs in sequence view. In our case, you can see that it is. So let's select all. With all items selected, I'll come into my cutter I see the individual characters listed. I'm going to remove the optimize orientation, come into our second frame, and I see that here's the cut file for my fabric. Important with the save, giving it a name, I'm going to use the save as type, scroll down, and find this scalable vector graphic, the SVG format, which is necessary for my Silhouette Cameo. I'll do the save. It automatically brings us to the folder in which these three files are saved. There's a file for each frame and a PDF to show us some information about those designs. As I come into Silhouette, if I do a file open, go get that design. It is the second one that I was interested in. Here you see the cut file for that fabric once again, it is going to give me this particular cut on that fabric. And that's how I got these holes in my lettering behind the repair stitches. I did say that we were going to up the challenge factor here. Remember though, you can stitch the repairs directly on the applique fabric. But having done this, my what if I kicked in and I wanted to try this look. If you do not have a digital cutter, you simply could print a template to use as a pattern. Coming under File, Print Preview, we see the word here. What is important to you is to make sure that under Settings, your artwork is checked so that your template will print the dotted lines of both the cut lines repair and the cut lines for the word. You would cut out your template in paper doll style and also perhaps cut out the repair holes. Here you can see that I've left them. Here you can see that I went ahead and cut them out. I would take some kind of soluble marker and draw around my holes so that I could then go in and cut out those holes knowing that they'll be in the exact position necessary for those repair stitches. Yes, the ability to add those manual repair stitches are quite fun on text but also they can be darling on many of the other designs. If we come up with a new screen into our designs, go into animals, the darling little bunny sitting here without the applique, design only, we'll back him up just a little bit here and turn on our realistic. He's cute just the way he is, but we can also go into our repairs and add any of the repair stitches. Remember, I'm going to group them so I can play around with position and rotation and so forth. I might even want to add another, maybe come down to some of the other options available here, group, and drag that down here. And for this one, I know that I want to rotate it so the curve goes along with the curve of his hind leg. And you could continue to add your repair stitches so that he goes from being a brand new bunny to a well-loved one. Remember, we can size a repair and drag back into position, but these stitches are locked in that we do not have control over them. If I come over here to Sequence View and Expand and take a look at my blue stitches, you notice that they are manual stitches which cannot be edited. We know that these cut lines are artwork. I could select them. I'm going to ungroup that particular repair stitch so that I can focus directly on the repair line. Again, it is artwork. We know that if we take a look up at the properties. But one of the really cool things the designers have given us is the ability to right-click, convert that artwork to a run stitch. That will actually stitch on your design. This ability to convert artwork to stitches opens up many other possibilities. I could come up here to my artwork tool and choose the heart, 
click and drag a heart large enough to fit around my bunny. We'll go ahead and make this fit so you can see it. I'll select that heart, drag, position, and maybe size just a little bit, however I wanted to play with that heart. But now I could do a right click, convert to run. Notice that over here in my properties, drop down for the type, I could choose motif and apply that to have a pretty little border around my bunny. If you saw my jacket in volume 103 of Designs and Machine Embroidery Magazine for April 2017, I did a freight effect that I created in Perfect Embroidery Pro. You can get the same look here in Dime Vintage with fewer keystrokes. In a new screen, we'll go into our designs, into flowers, the one I want is 80, so it's down in the list just a little bit here. I am going to bring up the one that does not have the letter D, so it is already an applique. We see it on screen. To achieve that same look, all we need to do is put a channel around the design. The first cut line is there for us. I'll select it, do a outline by using our tool here on the digitizing toolbar. I'm going to up that distance though to a 0.25 and OK it and you can see that I have another cut line around the first one. I'm going to choose that first one and ask it to move to front so that these cut lines will stitch out last in the design. You'll see why in just a moment here. And the next thing I'll do is select both of them, right click, convert to run. What I've done here is to give myself that channel effect around a design. Here you see the steps I used to create that channel look. First, you will stitch out the original design. Then you'll lay a piece of denim or other fabric that frays nicely over the design. You'll then stitch the two lines of channel that we just made those cut lines into run stitches. You trim both outside and inside. Then when you use a stiff brush to fray the edges, you have that fray on the outside of the design as well as the inside. And that's the look that you saw in that magazine article. Let's pull up a clean screen. Going back into the designs, you see the number of categories that we have. There are just so many designs that we are given. Thousands. Border decorations. Food objects, people, a huge number of interests are available. We've also been given something called color therapy designs. Each of these designs comes in in white or a single color. They were given to us to use with colored inks or dyes for endless custom creations. Here is just a small sample of the fun that you can have with those inks or dyes. For those of you who own both Vintage Embroidery and Perfect Embroidery Pro, you can bring all of the high-level digitizing features to your vintage designs. Here we are in Perfect Embroidery Pro. If you have just purchased both of these software, be sure to install Perfect Embroidery Pro first, as it is the parent software for all others. With PEP installed and registered, you would then install and register your dime vintage embroidery. Again, we are in Perfect Embroidery Pro. You see icons at the extreme right of your screen. Any of the other inspiration software that you own and have registered will show there and be available for you to use within PEP. The vintage icon is at the bottom of my list. Clicking on that icon brings us to the Vintage Designs catalogs with all of the categories. Once again, let's go into Flowers. The one we're interested in is number 10. I'll scroll down to find it. We're going to use the one with the D for design only. A double click brings it to screen. First, I'd like to select this smaller flower on top, change the color to yellow. Take that line right there, change that to yellow as well. So the top flower is in yellow, the bottom in blue. Let me select all of that design and we're going to come up here to carousel. Again, the beauty of this is that we can combine the vintage designs with the other properties available to us in Perfect Embroidery Pro. 
clicking on Carousel, we're brought into that dialog box for choices. I'm going to set the repeats to be six and then come down to apply. OK that so it comes to my screen. Turn on our realistic view and you have a beautiful wreath from the design in Dime Vintage. Here in Perfect Embroidery Pro, we have the added benefit of resequence by color. With all of the items selected, we'll go under Edit, Resequence by Color. Over in Sequence View, we have two golds and two blues. The reason for that, it treats the original flower as a separate unit from those in the wreath. All I need to do is click on that gold, drag it and drop it right on the original gold, scroll up, and once I collapse those, you see now that I only have the two colors to stitch out. And I do want the yellow to stitch first, so the pretty heavier blue stitches go over that yellow flower just a bit. We can get fun borders. New screen. Again, let's go into Dime Vintage. This time to Food. I'm after the wine glass that is number 52, so we'll scroll down just a little bit here. A little bit more for the one that I want. Almost there. Here it is with the gray. Double click brings it to screen. I am going to turn that to red so you can see it a little better. We're going to go up to repeat. Clicking on that, I'm brought into my dialog box. For this wine glass, I am going to leave the three across, but I want four down. We'll come and play to flip every other one horizontally and vertically. Do an OK. If I rotate that, I can see I have a very fun border that would be cute on a bar towel. I like this idea of border. Let's do another one. New. Over here to Vintage. Again into Food. If wine is not your drink of choice, perhaps you need that cup of coffee in the morning. We're looking for number 46. Scrolling down just a bit here, there is a couple coffee cups you could choose from. I'll use the D for designs only. Coming back into repeats, this time let's do two across and four down. Flip just vertically. OK that. Here we have our design on screen. If I bring in the realistic view, you can see how cute that is. And whether you want to run that vertically on an apron or again, we could rotate it and have it as a horizontal border. Truly just so very fun. Remember that wonderful whip stitch that we had in Vintage Designs? Again, if we own both Vintage and Perfect Embroidery Pro, we have that whip stitch capability to add to any of our satin stitches. A clean screen. Let's go up to Drop Down, Applique Shapes. If I scroll down, I'm looking for the Halloween cat. I'll do a double click, brings it to screen, right click, convert to artwork. I'm going to do just a little bit of editing in this artwork so that I can avoid a situation with the fun that we're going to add to it. I'll put another point here with a right click and drag this down just a bit. Now I'm going to select my cat, right click, create an outline. I'll go ahead and leave that default at the 0.08. OK it. I have two lines here. I'm going to select both of those, come up to my toolbar and choose combine, right click, convert to satin. And this is the trick. The whipped stitch is found under a satin stitch. Here is the default. Let me turn on the realistic so you can see that would be what it normally looks like. Coming over here to our fill type, a drop down on our arrow, and here is this wonderful new stitch whipped. We have the ability to do the regular and irregular edges. I'm also going to change the density to a 3. Come under jagged. Remember I had fun with this one too. I'll put both and I've changed the default to a 0.5 for a little bit more exaggeration. We'll go ahead and apply and look what fun we have. We have a design that is built into Perfect Embroidery Pro and because we own both Perfect Embroidery Pro and the new Dime Vintage Embroidery, I can use that whipped stitch on any of the designs. We'll take it a step further. Again, because we're in PEP, we have the fun symbol feature, a select, I'll do a 
click down here, we're looking for our I. It comes up right here. And I'll click here in place, select it, drag it down just a little bit. And now I'm going to copy paste it so that our little whipped cat has two eyes. And here you've used the features of both Dime Vintage and Perfect Embroidery Pro. This is just so much fun. I could go on and on, but I know you see it. The unlimited capabilities. Remember, it's not a must that you have Perfect Embroidery Pro to use Dime Vintage Embroidery. However, it just ups the fun factor. We saw in part one and here in part two how truly unique Dime Vintage Embroidery is. There are thousands of built-in designs with which you can create something customized for anyone on your gift list. It's so easy to use. Remember, to guarantee success in your embroidery with these new vintage designs, we need to keep these in mind. As I told you in part one, these are not suggestions. You really do want to follow this list. You want that 116 top stitch needle. Again, you will see in your manual that a 9014 chrome top stitch could also work. We want embroidery bobbin thread in the bobbin. We definitely need to slow down the embroidery speed to your 350 or 400 stitches per minute. Do not run it on its maximum speed. If available, place the spool on a vertical spool pin. If you're using the 40 retro thread, you can use the 11 or 12 embroidery needle. Once your machine is set up to use this new thread, you're off to create anything you want to create. Thanks for joining me in this tour of Dime Vintage Embroidery. I know that you really are going to enjoy.